now live. Right, thank you, uh, Joel. Uh, before I start the business of the meeting, I will go straight to each um, council mem committee member to confirm that they can hear and be heard. It is a legal requirement for me to do so. Please advise me at once if at any time during the meeting you experience any technical difficulties that prevent you from hearing or being heard. I remind members of the committee that you will only be able to vote on the application before the committee if you have been present for the whole of the presentation of and discussion on the application. I will now call each councillor in turn Please speak to confirm that you are able to hear me, and I will confirm in response that I can hear you. Councillor Graham Andrews. I can see and hear you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, and I can hear you. Uh, Councillor Paul Andrews. I can see you and hear you, Chair. Thank you, and also you. Councillor Polly Andrews. I can hear and see you, Chairman. And I can hear and see you. Councillor Fagan. Yes, I can hear and see you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Foxton. Yes, I can hear and see you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hunt. I can see and hear you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. I can see and hear you clearly, Chairman. Councillor Milmore. I can see and hear you, Chairman. Thank you. I can see and hear you. Councillor Milne. Uh, fully audible and visible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mill. Councillor Rohn, not present yet. Councillor Selden. I can see and hear you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, and I can see and hear you. Councillor Stone. I can see and hear you, Chairman. Thank you. And Councillor Watson. I can hear and see you, Chair. Thank you. Also you. Right, I shall now invite um, Mr. Bishop to uh, introduce all officers uh, at the meeting this morning. Thank you, Chairman, uh, members. My name is Kevin Bishop. I'm the Lead Development Manager for Planning Services. Uh, today, presenting the reports, item number six, New House QSOP, David Gossett. Item number seven, The Hay Meadow, Preston Wynn, Alistair Wager. And item number eight, three Avocet Road, Homer, our new member, one of our newest members of the planning team, Emily Brooks. Also in attendance, Chairman, we have our legal advisor today, Anne Gerzen. The, the governance team managing the meeting are John Coleman and Tim Brown. And in, in addition, Chairman, we have the highways officer, Mark Lewis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bishop. Um, can I request that the uh, public speaker for agenda? Item six, attending as a virtual attendee, Mr. Wordley, as an objector, is admitted to the meeting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bishop. Um, right. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Wordley. Good morning. Good morning. Hang on, I'll just turn down the, uh, the YouTube. Right. right. Sorry, yep. just to make sure there's no confusion there. Right, you are, thank you. Uh, welcome to the meeting, and I will call on you to speak following the officer's presentation on the application in due course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think it'd probably be useful if um, Mr. Wordsley would mute it. Thank you. I would like to welcome everybody to today's meeting. Uh, the Council is video and audio streaming this meeting live on the internet and making an official recording. The recording forms part of the public record of the meeting and will be available on the council's website. Please note that it is a legal requirement that every member attending virtual meetings is able to hear and where practicable see and be heard and where practicable be seen by the other members in attendance and the public watching. So I ask that you please have your audio switched on and where you are able to do so also that you have your video switched on. Please remember that what you say and do in the meeting has a global reach and your words and actions should be chosen carefully. 
And I also remind members to ensure that they are wearing their headsets while listening and speaking during the meeting. This will ensure that the audio quality is of the highest possible quality and background noise is significantly reduced. As these are extraordinary circumstances, there are some additional points for members and officers to be aware of. As part of our meeting etiquette and in line with normal committee practices, all microphones apart from mine will be placed on mute at the start of the meeting. I will run through the agenda in the customary way. When you wish to speak, please use the hand button against your name in the participants list, which should be on the right of your screens. I will then invite you to speak. You may then unmute your microphone. Please do not raise your physical hand as I do not want to miss anyone who may wish to speak. Please note that the chat facility has been switched off to ensure that members' contributions can be offered through the spoken voice and for the public record. Please ensure that all mobile devices are switched off to prevent interference with the audio and video system. Members are reminded that speeches are limited to three minutes. Public speaking arrangements. Please note that as part of the virtual meeting format, those registered to speak in accordance with the public speaking procedure, namely parish council, an objector and a supporter, are able to participate in the following ways. By making a written statement, a written submission, by submitting an audio recording, by submitting a video recording, or by speaking as a virtual attendee. I will deal with these formats in the following ways. For statements received by email, the legal advisor will read that statement out. For statements received by audio or video, the recording will be played live for the meeting. And for the virtual attend attending members of public, I will invite them to speak in turn via the audio video live during the meeting. <clears throat> Those registered to participate in this public speaking procedure have been requested to submit a written submission as well as a backup. If we experience any technical difficulties and this cannot be overcome promptly, the written submission will be used to ensure that the relevant representations are presented to committee. Right, thank you. Um, we now go into apologies for absence. Uh, before I do that, I notice that Councillor Roan has joined us now, so if I can uh, just confirm that uh, Councillor Roan can uh, hear and see me. You unmute yourself, please, Councillor Roan. Can you see and hear yeah, me? Yeah, yes, uh, it's, I've got a brand new device here, I've, um, which I've just got Wendy to send me the link to, so... It's all new to me. There are no buttons. It's just the screen. So technology and me aren't exactly good bedfellows, but I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you. I can hear you too. Right, we move uh, to item one on the agenda. Apologies for absence. Um, we have one apology, uh, Councillor James. Item two, name substitutes. We have no name substitutes. Um, so I move to item three, declarations of interest. Um, has anybody got any declarations of interest, please? There are uh, no declarations of interest. Move to item four on the agenda at the minute. Um, no matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring officer. I request that each committee member be asked in turn to indicate that they are content with the minutes. Um, can I ask Mr. Brown to... Uh, actually... right, thank, yeah, thank, thank you, Chairman. If member, members could say you know, for, against or abstain. So, Councillor Graham Andrews? Four. Councillor Paul Andrews? Four. Councillor Polly Andrews? Four. Councillor Fagan? Four. Councillor Foxton? Can you and yeah. Four. Yeah. Councillor Hardwick? 
Four. Um, Councillor Councillor Hunt. Four. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Milmore. Four. Councillor Milne. Four. Councillor Roan. Four. Councillor Selden. Four. Councillor Stone. Um, sorry, Councillor Stone, are you there? Four. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Councillor Watson. Four. Uh, thank you. Okay, those are confirmed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman's announcements. Um, the only thing that I really want to announce is that uh, after this first application, we will have a 10 minute uh, break um, where, as we've already uh, stated, you just turn your cameras and uh, microphones off, uh, but um, actually stay connected to the meeting um, and the uh, interval will be um, strictly 10 minutes. Okay, so we move on then to our first item on the agenda or first application on the agenda, item six, uh, new house Cusser, uh, Hay on Wye, siting of Shepherd's Hut to provide tourist accommodation, including the construction of a new vehicular access and as associated landscape works. Uh, we have um, planning officer, um, Mr. Gossett, who will make the presentation, and um, Councillor Hewitt, who is the local ward councillor, um, who will be entitled to open and close the, uh, the debate. Um, we have um, three speakers uh, this morning on this application. Uh, Cusop Parish Council, who have uh, sent a written submission. Mr. Wordley, an objector, he is present as a virtual attendee. And Mr. Rose, the applicant, who has also made a written statement. I've also already welcomed uh, Mr. Wordsley and will call upon him to speak following the officer's presentation on the application. And I'll remind him that uh, after the public speaking, uh, he will be returned to the waiting room. Um, he can then leave the meeting and watch on, on live stream. So, um, right, we, we move forward then to um, the officer presentation. As I say, Mr. Uh, Gossett. Um, in your own time, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just wait for the slideshow to start. <clears throat> okay, good morning, members. Firstly, just to flag um, a quick administrative matter. Um, the members update sheet has new comments from the Parish Council, a response from officers, and separately an update to the wording for condition four relating to drainage. Um, the application before members today is for full planning permission for a shepherd's hut specifically designed for tourist accommodation with a new access parking area and landscaping proposed. The location of, this, the, of the site is marked by the usual red star on the slide. It is located within open countryside, approximately four miles southeast of Cusop and Hay on Wye. It's within the parish of Cusop, but immediately adjacent to the border with Dorstone Parish. Next slide, please. The application site is marked here by the red edge. New house, the applicant's home and existing bed and breakfast is in the southeast corner of the application site. To the south of the application site on the opposite side of the road is a dense pine woodland as shown in the aerial photograph. The application site is bounded by native hedgerow of varying maturity, the roadside boundary to the south being the most mature. Next slide, slide please. This plan simply shows the area of common land to the east of the application site known as New House Patch. And it isn't wholly without of the application site, but abutting it. Next slide, please. Here members will see the proposed elevations of the shepherd's hut. The application form states the hut will be formed of timber walls painted green under a galvanized sheet metal roof with timber joinery for the windows and doors. Final details of this will be secured via condition as recommended. The proposed hut atop the wheels will measure 3.14 meters in height as shown on the plans. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed site plan and highway details. 
visibility splays set out of 48.8 meters to the west and 49.6 meters east are achievable and have been calculated following a speed survey. A small portion of hedge will be removed to gain access and a larger portion of hedge will be translocated behind the visibility space. The parking and turning area will be formed of reinforced grass and a proposed site plan shows an area of new tree planting to the east and west of the hut, shaded darker green on that site plan in front of you. The council's ecologist has confirmed there are no immediate ecology related concerns with the proposal. As such, given the applicant's duty of care under UK legislation, there are no reasonable causes to require further information on this matter. The translocation of hedgerow for the new access ensures there is minimal impact upon habitats and biodiversity, and the retention of trees will act as beacons for wildlife to follow. Furthermore, the new tree planting and thickening of hedgerow mitigates any loss of hedgerow. Uh, it is noticed, noted that the woodland to the south of the application site will also ensure there is no habitat connectivity lost as a result of the works proposed. Relevant conditions have been recommended by both the council's ecologist and tree specialist to ensure the translocated hedge establishes successfully and is protected and trees protected throughout the construction phase. The council's technical specialists have confirmed therefore that the proposal will align with policies LD2 and LD3 of the core strategy. In regards to drainage, while we have the proposed site plan in front of us, as shown, the proposal is to drain foul water to a new package treatment plant with final outfall to on-site soakaways. This is secured by revised condition four in the members update sheet. And this is the preferred option under policy SD4 if mains connection is not available. As the site lies within the River Y special area of conservation catchment area, it triggers the habitat regulations assessment process. The required appropriate assessment has been undertaken and confirmed there will be no likely significant effects upon the integrity of the River Y SAC. Natural England have subsequently reviewed this and returned a no objection to the assessment. Next slide, please. Here are some photos of the site taken from the C1205, just south of the application site where the proposed access is. The map in the top right hand corner shows where the location of the photos were and the direction they were taken. The blue highlighted photo is facing west from the access and the red highlighted photo facing east from the access. Details of the new access, as already described, have been reviewed by the local highways authority who were satisfied that subject to conditions the proposal would meet the requirements of core strategy MT1. The use of reinforced grass for the parking area minimizes the surface water runoff and visual impact of the proposal. Details will be secured by condition 11. While there are a number of representations relating to the highway's impact, the MPPF makes it clear that via paragraph 109, that permission should only be refused on highways grounds if the cu cumulative residual impacts amount to severe. Next slide, please. Here are some photos from within the application site, stood approximately where the shepherd's hut is proposed. The blue highlighted photo in the left hand corner is facing west from the hut, the red photo facing north, and the green highlighted photo on the bottom right is facing east towards new house and ancillary structures in the foreground. Next slide, please. This is a short video. Initially facing west from where the hut is proposed, moving along that site boundary through to the northern corner of the site. Finally moving round to the east, of the site boundary. And then finally around to New House itself, the ancillary structures in the foreground, and then to the southern site boundary where you can see the hedgerow. Next slide, please. This photo is taken from the northern corner of the application site facing back south towards the hut. Um, the view towards the proposed hut, um, you'll see that it's uh, to the rear of that is a mature hedgerow with intermittent trees and behind that again is a dense pine forest forming the backdrop to the application site. In summary, the application seeks planning permission for the siting of one shepherd's hut for tourist accommodation with new access and landscaping proposed. As covered in the officer's report and update sheet, in uh, the principle of development as established by policy 11 of the NDP and policies E4 and RA6 of the core strategy. 
NDP policy 11 sets out three exception criteria to the locational strategy of employment generating proposals. Under exception criteria B, activities such as farming and some types of tourism that can function effectively only if based within the countryside. This is reinforced by policies RA6 and E4 of the core strategy, which seek to support the rural economy by a range of methods, including the provision of small scale, small, small scale accommodation in rural locations if designed specifically for tourist accommodation. It is therefore considered the proposal aligns with the aforementioned policies. In terms of the landscape impact, policy 12 of the NDP seeks to protect the scenic beauty of Cusop Hill and the views of it from the settlement of Cusop. The ridge of Cusop Hill is approximately 0.5 kilometers south of the site. LD1 in the core strategy seeks more generally to ensure proposals demonstrate the character of the landscape has positively influenced the design, scale, nature and site selection while enhancing the natural, historic and scenic beauty of important landscapes. The site benefits from significant screening as shown in the photos and the hut will not be, a prominent top will not be in a pro prominent topographical location. As such, it will not be widely visible. <coughs> Furthermore, the single shepherd's hut will not appear out of place in this rural location. The proposal is considered in this regard to adhere to coal strategy LD1 and NDP policy 12. Moving on to the design and amenity, policy SD1 and policy 16 both seek to ensure the proposal is designed to maintain local distinctiveness with policy 16 specifically focusing on their immediate neighborhoods. SD1 goes on to state that the proposal should safeguard the amenity of existing and proposed residents in terms of overlooking, overshadowing and overbearing. The proposed hut is of a traditional design which appears appropriate for its setting with the final material specifications secured by condition three within the report. The application site is well separated from any immediate neighbors. The closest residential property, save new house, save new house itself, is 230 meters north of the application site. For reference, the photo on the screen at the moment was taken at approximately 80 meters distance from the hut. As such, the impact upon the amenity of these neighbors is, is re in regards to overlooking and overshadowing is considered to be de minimis. Similarly, with a single unit at this distance, it is not considered li likely to generate adverse effects relating to noise or disturbance. The issue of private water supply was brought up through consultation. Relevant to this is paragraph 183 of the MPPF, which states, the focus of planning policies and decisions should be on whether proposals, proposed development is an acceptable use of land rather than the control of processes or emissions where these are su subject to separate pollution control regimes. Planning de decisions should assume that these regimes will operate effectively. As such, given the modest scale of the proposal, it is considered that this element falls outside of the planning remit and will be effectively captured by other legislation. Applicants are reminded of this, of their duty under the Private Water Supplies England Regulations 2016 as amended and the Water Supplies Water Quality Regulation 2016 by the informative number six on the, on the um, officer's report. In conclusion, there are clear economic benefits derived through tourist accommodation, a fact that is supported in principle by the core strategy and NDP. While there is an element of hedgerow removal in order to accommodate the access, the majority of the hedge will be translocated behind the visibility splay and then for a period of 10 years protected by condition. Furthermore, a large area of new planting is proposed as part of the scheme and in terms of the landscape impact, a shepherd's hut is not out of keeping with a rural context and a relevant condition for the finish will ensure it assimilates into the wider setting. Overall, the proposal is considered to represent sustainable development with a number of identified benefits, including the large scale planting proposed, economic benefits and the ceasing of a substandard access. As such, it is officer's recommendation that planning permission be granted subject to conditions set out in the report and as amended by the members update sheet. Thank you, Chairman. That brings me to an end. Thank you, Mr. Gossett. Um, my name move across to uh, speakers and um, I will firstly ask the legal advisor, uh, Mrs. Berzon, to um, read the written submission from uh, Cusop uh, Parish Council. Uh, Mrs. Curzon, please. You're muted. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank, do. You. Thank you. I, I will start now. Thank you. This is a written submission from Cusack Parish Council. I wish to express concern about the failure of the planning officer's report to address and apply the relevant policy of the CUSOP NDP to this application. The policy in question is policy 11C, which outside the settlement boundary permits employment generating activities such as farming or some types of tourism that can function effectively only if based within the countryside. The word only is the critical qualifier here. The policy was worded in this way specifically to limit development in remote countryside, such as the site of this application, to activities that needed to be there. Otherwise, development was expected to be, to be within the settlement boundary unless it reused a redundant building in accordance with core strategy policy RA5 or was a small scale extension, extension of an existing business. The text of the NDP provides the thinking behind this policy. Paragraph 30, where growing local businesses need dedicated employment land, existing and prospective employment land in Kusop and Hay should meet this need and developers will be guided towards this land. While some businesses may prefer to be located in the countryside, most can be based satisfactorily within existing settlements. Paragraph 31. Nevertheless, there are land-based businesses, mainly farming and some tourism enterprises that need to be based in the countryside, and these enterprises are important. As well as providing direct and indirect employment, they help maintain a landscape that is highly valued by residents and visitors. It is another priority of the plan to enable such business to grow and diversify, while protecting the most sensitive locations from negative impact. The officer's report, in brackets, paragraph 6.10, notes the existence of NDP policy 11, but completely omits to address whether the application actually meets this policy. Then, in paragraph 6.13, the report concludes that appreciating that both the NDP and core strategy, as well as national guidance, encourage small-scale tourist accommodation, the proposal is found to be acceptable in principle. As far as the NDP is concerned, this is inaccurate. The NDP does not identify accommodation separately from tourist development generally, but it does but it does subject such development, accommodation or otherwise, to the qualification of functional need. The report notes that the application is compatible with core strategy E4, but this is not a green light for the application unless it is also compliant with the NDP. Even if officers judged that there was a conflict with the core strategy, it would have to be resolved in favour of the CUSOP NDP, which is the more recent document to be adopted. In any event, the NDP was examined in 2017 and found to be in general conformity with both national policy and the core strategy. So the question is, the proposed shepherd's hut, an activity that can function effectively only if based within the countryside? Our view is that it is not. Activities such as pony tracking centres or bothies for long distance walkers, which by their nature need to be in the countryside, are the sort of development that would qualify under this policy, not, accom not accommodation for carborne visitors, which can equally well be located within the settlement or reuse existing buildings, and especially not accommodation in remote uplands at the end of narrow road up a steep hill with hairpin bends. The report, paragraph 6.11, also brushes aside the opportunity that consent would create for further development. One shepherd's hut is a poor return for the works proposed in this application, so it is likely that the applicant will return for more. Indeed, the original application was for two huts. If the principle of development is established, what case could there be against two? And if two were permitted, what about three or four? Okay, thank you, Mrs. Gerzon. Um... May move across to uh, Mr. Wordsley, um, and uh, you should have three minutes in your own time. Thank you. Uh, you'll need to unmute yourself, Mr. Wordsley. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you. There are only two houses in this area because access to water is very limited and is increasingly fragile due to climate change. Water for New House comes off the same hills via springs as does ours. Extra water taken out by New House up the hill from our property increases the likelihood of impacting on our water supply. Approval could increase water usage by sixfold from the historic norm. 
additional water would be necessary for the horses referred to in the application, but not addressed in the case officer's report. A dwelling has been on our site drawing water for over 200 years before new house was built. Approval would be a material change imposed by the council and would affect our human right to access to water and is counter to core strategy SD3, which states that development should avoid an adverse impact on water quantity. Para 5.3.42 highlights that there is a finite capacity within the environment and it cannot simply provide more and more water as a result of increased consumption rates or overall demand. The application states that the area does not flood, but it does. Photographic evidence has been submitted. A culvert goes under the lane and exits into the subject field, adding to flood waters. Newhouse inherited sandbags issued by Cusop Parish Council precisely because of the problems of flooding. This development would clearly add to the flood risk in Herefordshire and is counter to core strategy SD 3.5. Location of additional parking spaces remains unresolved. Use of the park, uh, passing place in the lane opposite New House for parking has already caused problems on the highway. Turning the current agricultural field into a multi-car parking facility would fundamentally change the use of the site and increase environmental damage. Additional parking has been indicated between New House and the outbuildings, but no surveys have been conducted to establish if it meets visibility display requirements. The lack of identified additional parking presents a potentially severe impact on the safety of road users, a lane that is unlit and where speed can be an issue. It is counter to core strategy MT1, requiring safe and sustainable transport. An endorsement of the additional traffic that this application requires does not support core strategies SS1, two and four, and does not support the council's strategy to reduce CO2 emissions. Changes of use have been admitted from this application. Para 5.1c of the report poses the question about the extent and nature of the change of use. They are not included in the case officer's report and remain unanswered. I was advised that the breach of the Data Protection Act has been referred to the council's information governance team. This is still unanswered and has a material bearing on this application. To summarize, I strongly object to this application, which does, which does not meet a number of core strategy requirements. Thank you, Mr. Wordley. Um, I now ask the legal advisor, Mrs. Gerzon, to uh, read the uh, written submission by Mr. Rose, the applicant. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you unmute yourself? Bottom left. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. Uh, this is a submission by Mr. Rose, the applicant. Dear councillors, I wish to make a statement regarding our application to place a shepherd's hut in our field to provide tourist accommodation in order to clarify several issues and address some misinformation. Um, this is in bullet point form. Um, the water supply for new house from our spring is owned by us, is independent of all homes in this area. This is self-evident on inspection and we hold the deeds to confirm this. There is no shared water supply with our nearest neighbour, and excuse my, my pronunciation, uh, Pen Mint, which lies almost a quarter of a kilometre from new house. The water is drawn by pump from a spring chamber that fills naturally by the spring and any significant increase in water use will still be limited by the spring chamber having to fill up. There has never been a water shortage here. New house is a four bedroom property occupied by my wife and I. We have no children, so there is ample, so there is ample supply for a shepherd's hut. The water supply has been assessed and monitored by Herefordshire County Council Environmental Health Department since we opened our one bedroom B&B in 2018. The project has been described as a major caravan development by one objector. This is untrue as it is planned to be an exclusive experience, low impact and targeted at visitors with a love of the environment, wildlife and beautiful countryside. The relocation of the gate to our fields is primarily to address 
address public safety issues. And although some hedgerow would be re relocated, there would be no net loss of hedgerow. Plus the plan includes significant planting of new and mature trees, which would not only provide additional habitat for wildlife, but would also provide a windbreak and protection for the property and the environment. At some stage after 2030, there will be removal of plantation conifers from new house woods managed by Till Hill and not in our ownership across the lane. We understand that trees support significantly more species than the regularly trimmed low hedging that dominates the countryside. So our tree planting is a net benefit. The hedgerow can in no way be described as an ancient and was laid down in 2016. We have been portrayed by one objector as having little care for the environment. This is completely untrue. We have an incentive and interest in planting native trees to attract wildlife for our project. We have two millennium oak trees in pots that grew from acorns we planted in the year 2000 and brought these with us when we moved to Herefordshire in 2017. These will be planted as part of our mix of native trees. We have planted over a dozen trees already and have not removed a single one. Our wildflower, our wildflower meadow is thriving. There are no agricultural grants associated with this property. We are strong advocates of sustainable ecotourism and have visited and studied ecotourism projects around the world and have supported environmental charities, populationmatters.org, WaterAid, Woodland Trust, RSPB. We have installed insulation, an eco wood stove, um, in brackets silicon carbonide, plus a coir acetate softwood double glazed windows at Newhouse and have been able to reduce our use of heating oil. We are disappointed that Coostop and Doorstone Parish Councils have rejected to our application. And whilst I feel all rational concerns have been addressed, nobody from either parish council has ever contacted us or visited our property in brackets to our knowledge, to gain a better and more accurate understanding of this project. We hope that in the future, they will give all residents equal and fair consideration. We are new to the area and do not have an extensive list of contacts and the planning process has been exhausting and stressful, but we hope that this information is useful and gives the community confidence in this project and our care for the environment. As well as bringing income to business in the area, a shepherd's hut is ironically the ideal tourist accommodation to visit and to manage during a pandemic. This is also my employment and my pension plan. So whilst may, some may object to this, for myself, it is extremely important. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Curzon. Um, some of you may have noticed that we went over the three minutes slightly. Um, I was lenient. I gave the... Uh, the parish council submission a little bit longer than necessary, um, equally uh, for the applicant. Uh, but Mr. Wordsley was uh, very much within the, the three minutes, and thank you for that. Um, I'll now request that Mr. Wordsley uh, leave the meeting by being put back in the waiting room, but I will remind him that he can watch the live stream of the meeting on the council's YouTube channel. Thank you, Mr. Wordsley, and good day to you. <clears throat> right, we move across to uh, our ward councillor, councillor Hewitt, who is the local ward councillor for this item. Um, she speaks first and then has the right to speak at the end of the debate, but she does not get a vote. Uh, so in your own time, please, councillor Hewitt. So good morning, committee. Good morning, chair, councillors and officers. Um, I just, I feel that I'm here as ward councillor to represent two important principles. And one is how the, one is the community. The first is the community. They, they're the ones that vote. And the second is the biodiversity of our area. And um, I was going to start this application with um, one of the two major points, which I thought were water supply and ecology. But I find myself a little stuck between two opposing assertions between the Roses and Wordlies about, um, about ownership of water supply, a little like Manon de Source. And um, I've heard from the officer that this is um, not regarded as under the jurisdiction of planning. So despite the fact that we have SD3, which talks about making sure that this water supply is safe, and despite the fact that there's a human right to water, I'm going to sort of um, skip over the first part of my presentation, which was about water supply, only to say that there is a provision in the core strategy, which is SS6, 
which is contributing towards the distinctiveness of the settlement pattern. And the, new, the need for water in human habitation has dictated settlement pattern, which is presumably why the spring has, the water there has historically fed two dwellings. So we have a very small number of, hum, of human habitation here for an historic reason. And I do think that policy at SS6 um, applies here. Uh, as for dealing with wastewater, um, I'm the, we're, we see on the application that we've got a vortex system for the management of affluent discharge, um, but there isn't really um, any description or as to how the quality of the local water courses which feed into the Y is to be assured. The, this, we are in the Y catchment here and there's a requirement for a habitat regulation assessment. Now, I'm a little confused because the officer said that there had been one, but I, uh, I wasn't really very, I saw a no objection, but I didn't see an assessment as such. So um, I'm a bit concerned about that. So um, my main point here is a biodiversity point, and that's um, CS policies, core strategy policies, LD1, LD2, LD3, MPPF, 174A and B. And I'm suggesting that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence by which, I mean, you can only really judge on the evidence before you. Now, I see now that the officer has produced photographic evidence or video evidence of why well, it's just grass, isn't it? But I'd like Tim to put up um, the photograph, please, that I took the other day. Obviously, I didn't have access to the field, so I was just photographing from the hedge. Um, would you put that up, Tim, if you can, please? Okay, so it's put up, the, that's okay. So um, the ecologist James Bissett and Oliver Kay may be forgiven to some extent of judging that the problem here is only one of translocation of hedge and their subsequent um, necessity to mitigate for their hedge translocation. The necessity for creating an entrance which allows vehicles to enter and exit has arisen due to this proposal. There is an extant entrance whose use would have been intermittent and rural in nature for field management, which is now deemed unsuitable because vehicular use will be increased. The shepherd's hut housing will need two parking spaces. And here we see quite clearly that the hedge inhabitants have lower priority than the potential gains for the applicant. Thus, I mean, that's sort of boldly put, but my point here is one about when we, with more thoughtful and sensitive approach to this, we might have had a different suggestion on the table in front of us. So, so the ecologist James and Oliver Kay have sought to mitigate by suggesting tree planting. And this is where I think there's been a, a mistake, which, because I would suggest we need an ecological assessment of this field because what we have here is a species rich, unimproved or semi unimproved natural grassland. And MG5 grassland is a high priority for protection. And there are policies, we're minded of policy LD2 that requires us to conserve, restore and enhance biodiversity. And further for to restore and enhance existing biodiversity on site. The point here is that if you then go and, well, plonk vehicular access, you've got compaction of ground, you've got destruction of habitat for the invertebrates, and on that compacted ground, nothing grows. So there's an area in the field that will have damage to it. Plus, you've got visitors in the field, which are, unless they're sort of instructed you can look but don't touch or look but don't tramp, that field will be compromised. Further, if you plant trees on this field, you are actually 
basically saying, well, one ecology is more important than the other. So I'm going to read to you something that was um, a submission which was given by Dave Lovelace to the local nature partnership in 2016. Dave Lovelace is something of a local authority in relation to um, our biological data records. And he says, habitat surveys. And I think we are failing as a council in relation to this. And I think we, we could do better. There've been a number of these in the last four decades and the most comprehensive was conducted by the then Herefordshire and Radnorshire Nature Trust in the late 1970s. 1970s, yes, that, that was nearly 50 years ago. Since then, there have been other surveys with problems of variable quality and insufficient coverage, or both. In the last two years, at least three special wildlife trusts, so this is 2016, have been destroyed. Yet there's been no consequences for those responsible, and the information about the destruction has only come about from local people. There is not, nor has there been, any organised survey, let alone monitoring of habitats uh, in this county. And I just feel, you know, the reason we are saying, OK, we're going to translocate this hedge, oh, and then we'll have to mitigate by planting trees, is that we don't have an overall understanding of what how precious different parts of our ecology are. This is basically a food bank for, for the local bird life around there and for the mammals. So ecology in Hereford has only a regulatory function and it's almost impossible to deliver our responsibility to the environment under section 174A of the NPPF to protect and enhance biodiversity and geodiversity. Plan should, and it says here we should, as a local authority, identify, map and safeguard components of local wildlife rich habitats and wider ecological networks. We're in a climate and ecological emergency. And species rich unimproved grasslands are an invertebrate rich food bank for birds and other wildlife. We have 98% of Welsh unimproved grasslands lost. We have 90% in the 20th century of, of English MG5 grassland loss. So each little bit counts because our green and pleasant land is in fact, for invertebrates, it's a green desert, insectageddon, as the media call it. So if we're to deliver on our commitment as administration, we need to identify, map and safeguard the baseline biodiversity we have, and we're not doing it, and that's why it was missed by ecology. <clears throat> Sites of 0.5 of a hectare fall under Schedule 2 of the Town and Country Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Regulation 2017. I think this site is probably around, and I mean, this is a guess because I, I don't know, but I think it's around 0.5 of a hectare. It probably ended up as unimproved natural grassland because it was occupied by Lady Betjeman, who... I think when I first came to Herefordshire, was still using a pony and cart to get down to Hereford. So, you know, it wasn't, basically it's had low impact. It hasn't been improved by nitrogen to grow stock quickly. <clears throat> the because the ecological assessment was flawed in the first place, because we didn't know what we were dealing with, I think the remedial action destroys rather than enhances existing biodiversity. QSOP Parish Council regard this as outside the settlement area. The CPRE have raised similar concerns about habitat. We, we do need to set a precedent here. And I don't mean a precedent that says, oh, you can't do ecotourism, but possibly there, must have, there could have been a bit more pre-application advice, which says something like, we need to look at something different that doesn't affect the biodiversity in this amazing resource, which the roses recognize they have. They're very proud of their grassland. And I think there needs to be a more creative approach to say, well, okay, if you're gonna do something like this, you need to make sure that tourists walk, that they don't, they don't have to park on site and compact the ground and affect what little biodiversity we have. I don't think there's been enough proactive work on the part of the planning department in this, in relation to this, because we didn't identify what was there. 
So I can see no evidence that pre-app sought to explore with the applicant alternative siting options for, for this, for either the vehicles or the extra generation of income accommodation. Um, NPPF 157A, the local or plan, planning authority need to employ the following principles. If significant harm, and I would say, you know, it's like saying to the food bank in Hereford, oh, it doesn't matter if you don't give something, or it doesn't matter if you don't give something. And then suddenly the food bank is more reduced. So each bit of MG5 grassland that's lost makes a big difference. So it says, if significant harm to biodiversity resulting from a development cannot be avoided uh, with an alternative sites with less harmful impacts adequately mitigated, or as a last resort compensated for, then planning permission should be refused. Thank you, committee. That's the end of this part. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hewitt. <clears throat> we now go into uh, debate on this uh, application then. And uh, first in line is uh, Councillor Watson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my question is for uh, Mr. Gossett. Uh, Mr. Gossett, um, I'm just wondering, in the previous application, in 182146, um, there was a request for a seven-day speed survey, and um, by the other um, transport officer. And I'm just wondering, um, I can't see, maybe forgive me if there is one, I've not been able to find, has there been a, a seven day speed survey for this application? And the other issue is that um, uh, there, seem, there is an access towards New House, isn't there? And why is that access not being looked at? Um, because um, I read the CPRE report about the inconsistencies in the application and in the report. Um, and my other query is that, is it outside the settlement boundary of CUSIP um, NDP? So there are three points. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, I'll ask Mr. Gossett to uh, respond, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, there has been a um, seven-day speed survey undertaken outside the application site. It was done on the 28th of November 2018, and it was submitted as part of the supporting documents for this application. Um, the access closest to New House was considered previously to be unsafe for intensified use, given the, the ancillary building to New House is too close to that access, so you can't gain um, achievable visibility displays. Um, and then finally, it is not within the settlement boundary of QSOP settlement, but it is within the parish of QSOP. Perhaps there's a confusion there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gossett. Um, did you want to come back on any of those points, uh, Councillor Watson? Um, only one other one that I forgot to say. My point for is that why hasn't there been a habitat um, assessment carried out? Okay, thank you. And I'll ask Mr. Gossett to uh, respond to that one. Um, the ecologist considered it unreasonable to request any ecology survey on the site, given the scale of the proposal and that the application site is not noted as a, any priority habitat. And um, so given the scale of the development, it was considered unreasonable to request further information on that point. OK, thank you, Mr. Gossett. Uh, move across to um, Councillor Polly Andrews, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we have here a simple application for one shepherd park. Now this kind of tourism is a, a great earner for this county in normal circumstances and this kind of tourism is increasingly popular. I do know what these shepherd's huts are like. They accommodate two people. They're very nice but they are small, just two people and I can't see that the impact of one extra car which is, will have a great impact, a great impact. So I'm happy to move the recommendation for approval. Thank you, uh, Councillor Andrews. Um, have I a seconder, please? Not at this point. Uh, uh, yes. Councillor Johnson. Yes, I'll second it, Chairman. 
Okay, thank you. Right, we move on then to Councillor Fagan, please. Yeah, um, thank you. I'm struggling a, a little bit with this application because I completely understand the the need for sustainable uh, tourism, and <coughs> it does look to me like this um, application could could meet that. Um, the difficulty I have is with the the issue about the. Um, sort of the translocation of the hedge and uh, what I would like to ask Mr Gost is was it explored that uh, parking facilities could be provided within the actual um, footprint of New House itself it, it, was it absolutely essential to have a, a new vehicular entrance or could um, something have been accommodated within the, the current um, site? Okay, thank you, Councillor Fagan. Uh, Mr. Gossett, please. Uh, unfortunately, I, I wasn't the one processing this application early on. I'm, I'm here today presenting it um, by way of annual leave um, for Simon Withers. Um, so I'm unaware whether it was explored, um, but the application is set forward as, as it is at, at the moment. So um, that's what's under consideration. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gossett. Do you want to come back on that point, uh, Councillor Fagan? No, it's fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Councillor Polly Andrews, you've got your hand up. Are you, you wishing to speak again? No, Chairman. Okay, thank you. If you could put your hand down when you've finished speaking. Councillor Milne, please. Uh, th uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, the Parish Council in the submission which um, I uh, understand came quite late and it was um, it, uh, I appreciate that it was uh, read out as well, well as being submitted. Um, um, I might just ask the case officer who might further explain uh, how policy 11c in the parish plan um, how he feels that that does not apply. This, this is the one whereby uh, in my understanding, um, applications that um, cannot be met by uh, sites within the the the, 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 the um, residential area um, may be considered, but not otherwise. So um, she gave the example. Uh, the parish council clerk uh, gave the example of, um, a, a, say, a bothy for long distance walkers as as or pony trekkers as being possibly acceptable to support a tourist industry out in the countryside. Um, and uh, here we, we have uh, what, what effectively, I suppose, you could describe as a bothy for, for long distance walkers, um, but uh, being designed around motor car use, which is um, the, the, the sticking point, is, is it not, for this, this application? Is there anything further you could add on that, um, uh, Mr. Gossett, in terms of the the, the interpretation or <coughs> of that particular policy in the in the QSOP plan, eleven eleven C, I think it is. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Gossett. If you could respond to that, please. Uh, yeah, I, I'll direct firstly members to the update sheets where that was discussed. Um, it, I think that there might have been a, a slight error in the comments. It's it's policy 11B that we're we're stating that it adheres to, um, which is the the one that's been quoted. Um, so it's 11B. Um, firstly, th this type of bespoke small scale re, um, retreat style tourist accommodation um, would only be supported in rural areas outside of the settlements. It's the very nature of the proposal, and therefore it is officers' opinion that it does comply with policy 11B of the NDP. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gossett. Uh, Councillor Rome. Unmute technology. Uh, right, thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple of things to say. First of all, you don't have to drive a car to be able to stay in this place. It's just it's a facility in case the um, the guests would obviously, they are allowed to catch a bus and they are allowed to walk, I would imagine. I don't think it's, if you haven't got a car, you can't turn up. So there is that to consider. I think the contributions um, that were questioned about uh, the officer, James Bissett, 
I've known the officers and had lots of input with him over the years. I think if he's, uh, he's a professional in his field and, uh, and I think that what he has said shouldn't be taken as possibly made a mistake. I won't know, but I'm, I'm, it was said, so I'm going to defend him knowing the work that I've done with him. I think if we say no to an application like this for tourism in Herefordshire, we might as well put up a board saying we're closed. It is small, it is niche. I, I've never stayed in one of these things, but I understand as Councillor Andrew said, they take two people. It is like a shed on wheels, which I'm surprised that it's going to be fixed. It's got wheels. I'm absolutely all for it. And I would be extremely keen on seeing this sort of thing spring up all over our wonderful county. And if you take into consideration that fantastic video that we saw at the beginning of the presentation, who wouldn't want to stay there in the Golden Valley? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Uh, are we any further speakers, please? No raised hands. If not, um, I go across to, uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Watson. Um, yeah, uh, it's just a point is that um, around the dark skies policy, um, if this um, uh, application was to be approved, um, could there be something around um, a lighting, please, um, Mr Gossett? Right, Mr Gossett, please, if you'd like to respond to that. Just quickly checking through the conditions. I believe there is one. Yes, it's condition 17. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, so that condition is already uh, tabled. Thank you. And Councillor Milne. And, and I was simply going to ask uh, if the condition uh, for planting c can be uh, be quite care um, care carefully worded to take account of the importance <coughs> of uh, referring to the correct species. I mean, I, I acknowledge that the roses have brought with them oak trees from wherever they came from in um, when they moved to Herefordshire in 2016. But uh, th this, for example, is an area where we would expect Quercus betraya and not um, uh, this, the, the Dermast oak, the, the sessile oak, rather than the, the Bedunculus oak, for example. So um, j j just, just can we just be, be very mindful in view of the, 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 um, the, 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 the inadequately understood um, ecological qualities of the site that we do make sure that the new planting uh, is, is genuinely appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mill. Are we any further speakers, please? If not, then um, I go across to uh, Mr. Bishop, Mr. Gossett, um, if you want to make any final comments before uh, I invite the Ward Councillor to uh, sum up. I had uh, one quick comment off the back of Councillor Milne's last um, comments. There, there isn't a recommended condition at the moment that specifies the, the planting. Um, so there's a there's a standard condition that requires them to conform with the plans as submitted, but no condition specifically about the proposed planting. Okay. Could, could such a condition be added, Chair? Right. Um, I'll ask Mr. Bishop if um, he'd like to comment on that uh, aspect of this application. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, it, uh, I had picked that, that up as well. I'm happy to look at that. Uh, and discuss it if if the uh, proposer is happy to include that as part of the the uh, her recommendation. I know we have the rec within the recommendation we have the ability to add conditions in any case that forms part of the recommendation uh, put forward. But I'm happy to look at that uh, and clarify that with councillor with councillor Milne afterwards as well. Okay, uh, can I ask uh, councillor Polly Andrews then and uh, second to uh, Councillor Johnson, that you're content to uh, add that um, informative uh, to the conditions. An informative note, an informative note on a, a, a planting appropriate to the area. Is that what you're asking, Chairman? Well, it, it, it's actually a part of the condition. Sorry, I think that was the yes. wrong terminology. Yeah. Well, if necessary, yes. So I'm sure that. Uh, Mixed, mixed uh, trees is the way forward. 
<clears throat> fine with me, Chairman. Okay, mm. thank you both very much. Uh, any any further comments, Mr. Bishop? Thank you, Chairman. Um, we'll just check on the on the plans. It may, it, it may well be that the plans have got all the details on, but we will check on that. And by having that within the recommendation, we can we 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 can clear that. And I'll check that with Councillor Milne. Um, a very good debate on this proposal, Chairman. The issue um, relating to the QSOP uh, neighbourhood plan is, is one where the, 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 pro the professional officers have identified that the proposal is compliant with the scheme. It's uh, with, the, with the scheme, with the plan. Uh, it's, it's an expansion of existing uh, small tourism facility um, and it's been seen as, as, be, as being compliant with the plan in that respect. Uh, I, I, I note what um, the members have said regarding the biodiversity nature of the site, etc. Um, I'm, I'm sure members would be pleased to hear that the new environment bill, which is coming out and will be coming out in the, uh, later this year, should be bringing out some some further advice on this on this particular issue. But as you've seen from the council's ecologist, has quite clearly identified that is content with the, with the information which has been submitted and raised no objections. Likewise, natural the same with with natural England as well. And as regards the disposal of waste, um, as is a package treatment plant which is proposed, which will have soakways draining into the the service, which is a um, a standard uh, facility which is often utilised on non sewered areas. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bishop. <clears throat> I move across to uh, Councillor Hewitt to uh, close the debate, please. Okay. Um... Yeah, I, I'd i like to say from the outset that I don't actually think that I was directly criticising James Bissop and Oliver Kay. I'm basically saying that the response is to a highway submission. So highways say we've got to make a visibility display in order to get vehicles on there. So you've got loss of hedge. So immediately there's tree planting suggested. Um, and I... I seem to be unable to get it across that MG5 grassland has a biodiversity protection under it, under the Town and County Planning Association's advice in relation to this, that it's, it is, it, they do suggest it is meant to have an EIA assessment. Now, if we're just focusing mitigation on a hedge, then we're going to say tree planting. But if you put trees on that grassland, you are basically saying one form of ecology uh, ecosystem is better than another form of ecosystem. Further, I'd like to outline and, and to the committee that the red line is all the way around this site. The first application was for two shepherd's huts. I love shepherd's huts. I've stayed in one. I think they're fantastic things. I think they're a great idea. But the officer has actually indicated that he doesn't really know how whether it was explored about the parking behind Newhouse itself, there's quite an area on the plan, which looks to me, and I've been to see, see the area, as if some sort of provision could be made for parking actually within Newhouse itself. Alongside the field, there's a long, low-lying um, shed. I don't know whether in pre-app, considering you know, mitigating any adverse impact, there, there was any talk about, well, how about using this area here? How about converting this long, low-lying shed so that you could have accommodation for walkers? I absolutely think that what we're doing is making our open countryside a sort of a highway for, for vehicles to travel into and not to promote um, the thing that people have been celebrating since COVID, which is walking and being out in the open countryside, you know, I'm not suggesting everybody has to go back to Lady Betjeman's Pony and Trap, although it sounds delightful. What I'm suggesting is that we need a more sensitive and absolutely a more thorough approach to our ecological assessments, not so that Mr. and Mrs. Rose can't find an appropriate extra income, but so that this is possibly resubmitted in a more sensitive and thorough way. That's what I would say about it all. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Hewitt. Um, 
Right, we now go into the to the vote. Uh, we have tabled um, a proposal to um, approve this application, subject to uh, the amendment to uh, recommendation condition four on the update sheet, plus the additional uh, condition uh, that was mentioned with regards to um, the tree planting uh, specifications. Um, so. I must remind members of the committee that you can only vote on the application before committee if you have been present for the whole of the presentation and discussion of the application. Does anybody need to advise me that they are not permitted to vote? I don't believe that anybody did leave the, uh, the meeting. Okay, so I will therefore request that each committee member be asked in turn to state how they wish to vote. And I will turn to Mr. Brown to uh, take the count. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. If members could ind indicate whether they're for, against, or abstain. So, Councillor Graham Andrews. For. Councillor Paul Andrews. Against. Councillor Polly Andrews. For. Councillor Fagan. Abstain. Councillor Foxton. For. Councillor Hardwick. For. Councillor Hunt. For Councillor Johnson. For Councillor Milmore. For Councillor Milne. Uh, for Councillor Roan. Yeah, for Councillor Selden. For Councillor Stone. For Councillor Watson. Sorry, Councillor Watson. Abstain. Right. Okay. Right. So that's 11 for, one against, and two abstentions. So that is carried, Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, as Mr. Brown stated, uh, that uh, application is approved. Um, we are now going to have uh, an adjournment uh, for 10 minutes. Um, I make it just before quarter to 12. So if uh, we can say we'll resume this meeting at uh, 5 to 12. And um, I'll remind members um, to turn their cameras and uh, their uh, audio. Hopefully you're still there. Right. Good morning, Mr. Thomas. Welcome to the meeting. And I will call you to speak following the officer's presentation on the application in due course. Uh, can you hear us okay, Mr. Yes, thank you, Thomas? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I can hear you and see you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You're you're a little bit quiet, so if you've got the ability to turn your microphone up, that would uh, that would be good for when when we come to you. Okay, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> right, we move on then to item seven: uh, the Hay Meadow, Preston, Wynn, Hereford erection of domestic outbuilding for the purposes incidental to the enjoyment of Hay Meadow, including associated extension to the residential planning unit. Um, we have um, Planning Officer Alistair Wager, who will make a presentation this morning, and uh, Councillor Paul Andrews, who is a member of this committee, but stands aside from the committee and acts as ward councillor for this application, and therefore uh, doesn't get a vote. Um, we have three speakers this morning on, on this application. Mrs. Glover Clark to the Withington Group Parish Council, uh, who has made a written statement. Uh, Mr. O'Neill, an objector, who has also made a written statement. And Mr. Thomas, the applicant's agent, who, as we are aware, is present as a virtual attendee and will speak um, when invited to. So I think that is all I need to do in the introduction. So across to um, Alistair Wager to uh, make the presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll just wait for the presentation slides. Okay, fine, thank you.
Perfect. This detailed planning application relates to land at Haymeadow, Preston Wynn, which is indicated with a star on the map shown. The application seeks planning permission for the erection of an outbuilding for purposes incidental to the enjoyment of the dwelling house and the change of use of an area of land to form part of the residential curtilage of the dwelling house. The application site is located within the Withington Neighbourhood Development Plan area. Next slide, please. Preston Wynn is a small village situated to the north of the A465 Hereford to Bromyard Road. The application site is edged in red on the plan shown and is accessed off the public highway via a modest and private highway known locally as Marsh Lane. The majority of the dwellings in the area are detached and set within ample curtilages with a variety of outbuildings of various designs. The aerial image bottom right shows an overview of the site. However, members should note that the host dwelling had not been erected at the time this photo was taken and it is shown um, to offer a wider site context um, of the proposal. Next slide, please. This slide shows the location plan uh, of the application to the left uh, with a blue line denoting other land within the applicant's ownership and the red line denoting the application site. Uh, with the block plan shown as proposed on the right-hand side of the slide. The application predominantly relates to land uh, to the rear of the dwelling of the host dwelling um, beyond the existing domestic uh, garden, all of which is currently laid to grass. The host dwelling itself was granted consent in 2016 and includes an area of gravel to the fore and an existing garage also in front of the dwelling. Next slide, please. To offer context, this site photo is taken from within the existing garden of Hay Meadows, uh, looking up to the north across the application site. The post and rail fence that is visible is currently uh, is the current boundary of the residential garden. Next slide, please. The top left photo, uh, site photo is taken looking east across the site of the proposed outbuilding, with the, again the post and rail fence uh, shown. The bottom right site photo is taken uh, at the boundary fence of the existing garden looking south uh, towards the host dwelling um, and the adjoining dwelling um, which lies to the east of the applicate of the host dwelling. Next slide please. This site photo shows the application site looking south towards the host dwelling. To the left of the site photo the oak tree can be seen which is referred to at paragraph 6.24 of the officer report. Uh, the oak tree lies on uh, adjoining land in third party ownership and forms part of the curtilage of yew tree house which lies to the east. The centre of the tree is considered to be approximately 20 metres from the edge of the application site with the canopy extent being circa 12 metres from the edge of the application site. Officers consider that the proposed building would not have an adverse effect uh, on, the, um, on the existing oak tree and the adjoining garden due to the separation distance between the tree and the proposed development. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed elevation and floor plans uh, for the outbuilding. The form of the outbuilding proposed would consist of a shallow dual pitched roof covering uh, the storage building. Uh, with a width of circa 15 metres, a plan depth of approximately 11 metres, with a height to the ridge of just under 4 metres. The proposal would be clad in horizontal timber cladding on a red brick plinth, uh, with the roof being made up of black insulated panels and rainwater goods also being finished in black. Officers note at this stage that policy P4 of the Wellington Neighbourhood Development Plan, uh, which relates to local distinctiveness, housing layout and design, specifically criteria D, which sets out that garaging should be set behind the principal elevation of the dwelling house and not visually dominant in the street scene. The proposed outbuilding is considered to accord with this requirement of the NDP. The proposal is considered to be of an acceptable design and form that accords with the expectations of the development plan in this regard, with the amenity of neighbouring dwellings being preserved. Accordingly, the, uh, according with policy SD1 and LD1 of the core strategy, as well as the provisions of the uh, Withington Neighbourhood Development Plan. Next slide, please. The proposed outbuilding will be sited approximately 30 metres to the rear of the existing dwelling, with all all access arrangements being down the side of the host dwelling. Officers conclude that the building would be of a use incidental to the host dwelling due to the proposal being for accommodation of the resident's hobby, a private motor vehicle collection, as well as tool storage, which is considered to sensibly relate to the enjoyment of the dwelling. And with a proviso that 
a condition and number of conditions is imposed to ensure no commercial activity takes place uh, in the outbuilding is considered to be acceptable in this regard. By way of a verbal update to members, the Herefordshire Historic Environment Record does identify modern enclosure boundaries at Preston Marsh, which reflect the enclosure of former open field furlongs. Officers note that remnant medieval open field is relatively common feature in the Midlands landscape with the development not directly affecting the hedges um, around the site, um, uh, which would be preserved. There are no designated heritage assets in the vicinity of the application site. Accordingly, officers do not consider the proposed development would detrimentally impact the character or appearance of the landscape and accords with policy LD4 of the core strategy and the provisions of the NDP in this regard. The application as proposed um, and with conditions recommended below is not considered to give rise to any conflict with the development plan nor the provisions of the framework and officers recommend the application for approval subject to conditions as detailed in the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wager. Right. Uh, we now move across to um, uh, speakers this morning um, and we have a written submission from the Parish Council, and if I could ask our legal advisor, Mrs. Gerson, to um, actually read that out, please. Thank you. You, you are unmuted. Thank you, Chair. This is, this is a letter from Withington Group Parish Council, um, objection to the planning application. Um, I'm writing on behalf of the Withington Group Parish Council to confirm our objection to the original and amended planning application. The Parish Council objects to the application for a number of reasons, and these include the following. Number one, the size of the proposed building is excessive in both height and width and length, and beyond that, which could normally be described as ancillary to the dwelling house, and there is already a substantial garage on site. We have also taken into consideration the lower height. If approved, this size building in such a rural setting would not protect the general character and amenities of the area and the negative impact on the residential properties surrounding it. Number two, the plans show that an access road exists, which it does not. The current access runs to the rear of the house only, and a new access road would need to be built where there is a hard standing turning area. Also, Marsh Lane is a private no-through road where all of the residents maintain at personal cost and all residents use this lane as such a building is likely to increase the volume and nature of the vehicles using the lane to access the proposed building. Number three, there are trees and hedges that are important to the character of the area surrounding the plot. There are mature hedgerows, there are oak and ash trees which are a natural haven for wildlife and characteristic of the general area. It is believed that wildlife may be adversely affected by such a large building. There is an old established oak tree where its roots could be damaged and where the tree preservation has been asked to assess also. Number four, the application is outside the Neighbourhood Development Plan Settlement Boundary, approved by Herefordshire Council October 2020, and therefore the rural development policies apply, which would be against the proposal. Number five, noise. The, the possible use for repair and restoration of vehicles in close proximity, proximity to the other properties would create additional noise any time during the day and all night. Number six, if the planning application is granted, the parish council would ask for a strict condition to be placed on it for no commercial or business use as there is local concern about noise pollution should it be used for industrial use. Also that no plant or machinery be used or installed on the premises. Um, response to the planning officer's report. Please see below comments which solely relate to the plan planning officer's report and they've gone through a list of points um, which relate to the report. Um, item 7, it, it, two point, paragraph 2.3 excludes reference to the policy relating to the Preston Wind Settlement boundary which is clearly relevant to the application. Uh, 6.3, this states that the NDP stakes precedent over the policy documents that the settlement boundary is relevant. 6.5, whilst changes to the curtilage may be acceptable. 
um, the construction of the garage changes the whole impact of the area. Similar changes to the curtilage in Withington at the Mintons have been accepted, but with no structures being acceptable in the extended area. Even barbecues and gardens and furniture have been restricted. 6.11, this totally twists the aim of policy P4. The house already has a garage at the front, which if applied for today would breach the policy. The proposal is not a replacement as it is intended that the existing adequate garage for a house of this size remains. It is noted that the planning officer is not seeking the removal of the existing garage to ensure that the results in overall development aligns with the up-to-date policy. Paragraph 6.14, this reference is permitted development is a total red herring as accepted by the planning officer as the applicant does not want this extremely large structure in his existing back garden. 6.21, the reliance on conditions to control what is beyond any reasonable ancillary residential use is unacceptable. There is no monitoring in place through the county and enforcement action is difficult to secure, as well as it being a likely process during which activities could continue contrary to the conditions. Paragraph 6.36, the proposal is not in accordance with the up-to-date development plan, namely the Witherton Group Parish Neighbourhood Plan being outside the settlement boundary and this development in the open countryside, which is also not in accordance with the core strategy. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Curzon. <clears throat> I'll give you an opportunity to catch your breath because I'm going to call upon you again to... Uh, read out a written submission by Mr. O'Neill, uh, who is an objector. Uh, in your own time, please, uh, Mrs. Curzon. Thank you, Chair. This is a objection from uh, Mr. O'Neill. The residents listed below are objecting to the granting of planning permission for the proposed building due to its design, size, use, and loss of amenity to the area. We firstly object to the change of land use the land is outside the settlement boundary, designated countryside, and has an SMR listing 53342 for historic and archaeological reasons, none of which seem to have been considered by planning or the applicant. Report reference 6.7 policy SD1 states development should respect scale, height, and proportions of surrounding developments and safeguard residential amenity, but report reference Paragraph 6.13, officer states, the building is rather large, but not disproportionate to other ni nearby buildings in scale. Referencing a stables, in brackets, actually 80 square metres, and a home office garage, in brackets, actually 90 square metres. The requested building at 167 square metres is almost double the footprint. The officer's report, reference 6.8, NPPF, buildings should add to the quality of the area, have good design, be visually attractive and sympathetic to local character. An off-the-shelf industrial building is none of these. Officers report paragraph 6.16. The building is not considered to be overbearing or dominating impact on the landscape or neighbouring properties. A building of this size with three roller shutter doors will dominate the landscape. It is an excessive size for stated use storage of six vehicles. The building occupies the mass of six coaches parked side by side. A garage storing six vans parked with doors open would require 110 square metres. The building at 167 square metres could accommodate at least 10 vehicles. The height is also excessive. A garage normally requires a three metre apex for the said use. Paragraph 6.15 of the officer's report states, the proposed building is for the express purpose of storing vehicles and implements, not for commercial purposes or a mechanics workshop, which officers would expressly deem to be unacceptable in such a location. The applicant's planning statement, paragraph 3.2.1, states that the building will be used for storage and maintenance of vehicles. This is contradiction of the officer's express view that a mechanics workshop would be unacceptable. Therefore, we would strongly urge the committee to refuse this application. Should our objections be unsuccessful, we request that recommendations section four is amended to include a condition. The premises shall be used for storage purposes only and that no re renovations or repairs on vehicles should be carried out and no vehicles should be left running for extended periods in the external areas of the proposed development. Request based on statements to the officer from the applicant that the building was a storage only. And the objecting residents um, are Mr. and Mrs. O'Neill, Dr. Shabana, Mrs. Cunningham, Mr. and Mrs. Schofield, Miss Yates and Mr. Crampton, Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, Mr. and Mrs. Barrett, and Mr. Edwards. Hey, thank you very much, Mrs. Curzon. Um, now move across to um, Mr. Thomas, who is the applicant's agent. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Uh, 
three minutes within your own time. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, members. I'm speaking this morning on behalf of the applicant, Mr. Pickering, in support of his application for an outbuilding at his property, Haymeadow, for the storage of his private motor vehicle collection. I thank the case officer for his comprehensive and clear report, which establishes some important principles. Firstly, the report confirms that a building for this purpose and of this scale can be considered incidental to the enjoyment of Mr. Pickering's dwelling. To provide reassurance if it were needed, the building is designed and will be used as a storage facility and not a workshop. There is no vehicle pit, ramp or lift. The building height would not accommodate these. The objective of the building is to allow the applicant to bring his collection under one roof on his property. Mr Pickering owns and runs a business at Rotherwurst and has neither the time or inclination to be engaged in motor vehicle repair work in his limited time off or indeed in any other commercial activity. Secondly, the report confirms the building's discrete location in the wider landscape and lack of visual impact. The report also notes outbuildings of similar scale associated with dwellings nearby, such that the proposal would not be out of character. Thirdly, the building has been substantially redesigned to reduce the height to below four meters and amend the materials to timber boarding over a brick plinth which your officers agree is more befitting of the surroundings. The site for the building is chosen to ensure minimum visual disruption to neighbours and as reported is far enough away from the mature oak on the neighbour's land to avoid disruption to the root system. The officer report refers to the fallback position available to the applicant, but the preference is very much to site the outbuilding the location shown as opposed to within the existing curtilage which would bring the building closer to the rear of neighboring dwellings and would thus be more prominent. The applicant is perfectly content to accept the conditions proposed that limit the use of the building and the removal of permitted development rights for further garaging. We therefore agree entirely with the officer's recommendation to approve the proposal and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. Um... I would now request that Mr Thomas leave the meeting by being put back in the waiting room, but uh, I'd like to remind him that he can watch the live stream of the meeting on the Council YouTube, and thank, uh, thank you very much Mr Thomas, and good day to you. Right, we now move across to uh, Ward Councillor for this application, Mr pa uh, Councillor Paul Andrews, um, local ward member for this item. He is a member of the committee, as I previously stated, but as local ward member for this item, he can speak but does not get a vote. So in your own time, uh, Councillor Andrews, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, thank you all um, for listening to this application and for the parish councillors and officers and members of the public for their time on this case. I have severe reservations about this application being brought before us today. I cannot support it and neither can the parish council or the members of public nearby who have made their objections known. This application is outside the parish NDP settlement boundary in open countryside and to be, seems to be dis purportedated request in terms of space for personal vehicles. Please remember this property enjoys a garage at the front with a large parking area. What con concerns me most though is the failure to mention anywhere the impact of the proposal on the listed heritage monument status regarding to the furlong strips in fields adjacent to the application site. I appreciate the officer if I've now made reference to and seem content to cover this off this morning, but this is not an acceptable way to conduct planning process. The whole point of this coming to committee is because of the public interest and the need for due process to be followed and to be seen to be followed. Potential material factors such as the heritage monument should have been highlighted and addressed during the consultation process not the morning of the committee meeting. 
I think it's fair and probably for us to defer this decision and arrange a site visit so members of the committee and public are fully aware of all aspects of the application before we make a decision on it. Failure to do that, I feel, would, would be a failure and betrayal of public trust. Remember, this is a residential area on, on a private road. That's all I have to say at the moment. Thank you. I'll listen, okay. listen, wait for the debate. Thank you, Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Uh, right, we're ready to go into the, the debate um, in full. I've uh, got Councillor Fagan first, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I mean, on the uh, sort of at face value, it looks like <coughs> an incredibly big building. Um, that that was my first uh, impression of it, and I I understand that they're willing to accept the conditions um, in terms of uh, it could this could be for storage of vehicles only, and um, that that they would omit per permitted development rights, but. I, th I think the the issue that Councillor Andrews has brought forward, actually, for, for me, that's the greatest concern: is that we we're presented with information on on the morning of the planning committee that actually is is significant information with regard to the siting of this garage in in this residential area, as Councillor Andrews said, on a private road, and I, I would um, suggest that we actually defer this application so that we can properly look at the information that's been provided in terms of the heritage monument and could we have a site visit so that we can actually look at the site because I don't feel that I have enough information to make a decision on this. So uh, that is my proposal that we defer for a site visit. Thank you, Councillor Fagan. Um, have we a seconder for a deferral, please? Yeah, happy to, Chair. Uh, I've got Councillor Foxton's um, hand went up first, I believe. So, uh, Thank you. Yes, please. Right. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if uh, if we go into a deferral vote, um, do we take that now uh, before we go into any further debate? In my view, Chairman, it's not actually a requirement that you take it now. Um, it's a judgment as to you know the will of the meeting. Okay. Right. Uh, well, we'll continue with the debate now then and um, and see where we go. Uh, but uh, that motion has been tabled for a deferment. So next on the um, list is Councillor Milmore. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to ask a question uh, about the NDP settlement boundary. Um, I appreciate this is outside the settlement boundary, but as this is not a residential property, is it relevant? Right, if uh, I could ask uh, Mr. Wager to uh, respond, please. Of, of the, the application isn't for the erection of a dwelling. It's merely for um, the slight extension of the residential curtilage and the erection of an outbuilding. And officers don't consider that the, the settlement boundary um, is, is wholly relevant uh, in, the, in this instance, um, in that it's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't preclude this application from being supported by officers. So yes. no. Thank you, Thank Mr. Wager. Uh, did you have further uh, comments to make, Mr. Milmore, at this stage? No, thank you. That just clears up my, um, what was in my mind. So, thank okay. You. Thank you very much, Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this uh, question is for uh, Mr. Wager. Um, Mr. Wager, I'm just concerned about the water runoff uh, from the roof um, going. I understand it goes into a soakaway. And I was just wondering, because it's quite a big building and, and a heavy rainfall, that's a substantial amount of water going into a soak away. And have there been any surveys done on that amount of water going into the soak away and the impact on that? And my other point um, is um, to the chair or to Mr. Brown is that uh, when Mrs. Gerson was reading out the parish council's first, um, the first um, report, 
because it's a red report, are we able to actually receive that to read it in advance? Because I know that you're probably doing it to time, Mrs. Gerzon, but that first one was really fast and I, I had difficulty listening to it. And, um, but the second one was at a nice pace. Um, so I don't feel that we gave really... Um, yeah, good coverage and yeah, so it's just, so there are two points, one about the water run off the roof and the second one is that can we receive the to be read reports in advance? Thank you. <clears throat> Who wants to answer that one, uh, Mr. Brown or, or Miss, Mrs. Gerzel? I'm, I'm happy to have a go first if you wish on the red okay. reports, Chairman. Um, I mean, the only I mean, the aim was to, as I understand it, to replicate as far as possible the process that we'd follow with a speaker. So, you know, normally the speaker turns up um, and reads their statement at whatever speed they can consider appropriate. So um, that's what we've tried to replicate. Um, and, and we, you know, we could. Um, you know, write to those with a written submission and ask if they want it circulated, if you want that to be um, tried as an addition. Did Mrs. Gerson want to add anything to that? Is, um, is, there, any, is there any reason why, um, as members of the committee, uh, we wouldn't be entitled to actually see that submission prior to the planning committee meeting? I mean, I, I'm, ha I'm happy to comment if, if, if I can just briefly, Chairman, that um, clearly in, in the case of Cusop Parish Council, um, they did ask that their submission be circulated in advance, which we then did. Yeah, true. OK, so there's there's no um, nothing stopping that, that happening then. OK, it, it's our internal procedure. But, but we would need the agreement of the uh, speaker, I believe, to um, to actually circulate that course, yeah. Okay, fine. I think that clarifies that point, uh, Councillor Watson. Did, did you have any further comment to make? Uh, no, uh, no, not on that point, but I would like the water runoff um, from Mr. Wager, please. Thank you. Okay, fine, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wager. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's perfectly normal <coughs> for, for the erection of buildings for for surface water to be managed via soakaways, uh, that's that's an industry standard, and we would expect for the soakaways to be designed to an acceptable standard to to accept that that amount of surface water runoff. Um, for example, large industrial and agricultural buildings of thousands of square meters treat and manage their surface water through through soakaways and other other methods, um, and I think that's that's a perfectly acceptable arrangement for this it's it's secured via condition seven in the in the officer report um, and if it did prove that um, there were difficulties in that regard there's there's a, a an option for um, other other arrangements to be agreed by the local planning authority but it's perfectly normal for for buildings of this size uh, to have their surface water managed via soakways okay, thank, thank you thank you mr uh, councillor johnson please Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, two questions, Chairman. Uh, number one, I'm not sure who may answer it. Do we know where the applicant's collection of cars is presently held? And secondly, um, my experience with um, uh, car collections is that often they have to be delivered or moved around on the back of car carrying lorries. So perhaps this question to Mr. Wager, <clears throat> is, is the proposed access wide enough to accommodate lorries that will, I would think, almost inevitably be required to move this uh, move cars to and from the site? Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Wager, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know the exact location of the of the car collection at the at the present time. Uh, my understanding is from discussions with the applicant's agent that it's in a number of locations, um, such as in industrial buildings, uh, at his place of work, and he's looking to consolidate it at his property as it's his private collection. But I don't have I don't have the, the finer details of exactly where it is at the moment. And regarding the access, um, officers don't have any concerns regarding the access. This is for for an outbuilding that is um, ancillary to the dwelling, um, and I, I don't think there's any 
any concerns regarding highways access that I'm aware of. Fine, thank you. Uh, Councillor Milne, please. Yes, thank you. Well, well, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and appreciate uh, the case officer for, for um, mentioning the historic environment. You, you couldn't possibly um, expect me to run through an entire committee without, um, without, without reference to to the historic environment at some point. And we've got um, uh, here a medieval field st strip field system, which is uh, uh, most perfectly expressed in the early maps. It's um, still perfectly readable today. The um, boundaries have that very um, delicate reverse S shape, S profile in the, the eratral curve that uh, that you characteristically get from, from relic to um, um, medieval uh, agrarian practice. And um, I, 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 do, I do think that uh, we... Uh, damage this at our peril, and a, and, a, and, a, and a development such as this, which is after all irreversible, uh, uh, of a considerable size, does um, does damage that uh, those landscape qualities, which we're we're, we're committed to to enhance and protect. Um, so that's my first first uh, point. The second. Uh, is more one of a, a request for clarification from from the case officer over the um, uh, over the, uh, the, the the matter of size. Now, I think we we would accept. Well, I I think I would accept that um, uh, this building, this proposed building, can can be described as incidental to the immunity of the residents. But is it reasonably? Um, is it reasonable to do so in view of its view of its size? Now. I, the residence was constructed, um, this brand new, it's 20, 2017, four bedroom house. Uh, so it's not, not, a, not a, it's a substantial, substantial house. And yet this is considerably larger than it. Whereas in it, uh, a building that is described as uh, incidental to it, one would normally consider to be uh, subservient, uh, smaller than, um, and it already does have a double garage, which, which fulfills that, that um, which answers to that. So perhaps if um, the case officer could just clarify what experience we have in case law about the matter of size, whether uh, uh, an incidental, a building incidental to, to a residence, which is so much larger than the residence itself, can be described as reasonable. Oh, thank you, Councillor Mill. Uh, Mr. Wager. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, take, taking the, the heritage matters first, um, obviously, uh, as I stated in my presentation, there are no uh, designated heritage assets in, 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 the, in the vicinity of the application. That's, there's no listed buildings and it's not conservation area. Um, so the consideration of the, the field pattern is one of landscape character and, um, and of whether the, the field pattern is a non-designated heritage asset. Uh, which is something that officers have considered and have updated members on. Um, re referring to the size of the um, of the outbuilding that's proposed, um, size isn't a de determinative factor um, when considering whether a use is incidental or not to the to the prime use. Um, this is this is laid out in in a bit more detail, uh, paragraph six point one seven of the of the officer report, which members may wish to refer to. Um, but it's a, it's a matter of um, fact and degree and a matter of planning judgment as to whether a use is incidental um, to the prime, primary use um, and size is a determinative factor in that regard and, and case law has established that. Um, regarding the scale of the proposed building, it, it does have a footprint of, um, I think it's 160 square metres um, circa. Um, however, the host dwelling is um, a large detached four bedroom dwelling um, and it's a matter of judgment um, as a matter of fact and degree as to whether the, the use that uh, is incidental or not to, to the host dwelling. Um, in this case, officers do feel that it is incidental and that's clearly set out and explained in the officer report. Thank you, Mr. Wager. <clears throat> um, I've got no hands up at the moment. Is there any other committee member that uh, wishes to speak to this application at this stage? If not, um, if I go across to um, Mr. Bishop uh, to make any comments before we take the vote, please. 
No, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, members have covered all the various points, and uh, thank you, Ms., uh, Mr. Wager, for also covering the heritage aspect as well, which came up late in late in the day. Uh, but we were able to uh, uh, discuss that very briefly with the archaeological advisor this morning, and that was his advice, which came forward as well. So, in terms of this proposal, Chairman. Um, there is a fallback position for the applicant, and that fallback position is that he could put this building in the back of his garden, and he doesn't, and he does not require planning permission. So he could put that size of bit, a similar size of building, a fraction, a fraction smaller, but I, I believe it would be, in terms of its height, but its height alone. But he could put that building in in the back of his garden, closer to other residential properties, which would not require planning permission. We could not issue any uh, any controlling conditions on that to prevent uh, um, it being used for any purpose other than incidental to the enjoyment of that dwelling house. So that that is the applicant's fallback position uh, on this particular proposal. Um, yes, they could appeal if an, if the application got refused. They could appeal the decision. That is another f uh, position they could go in. But their but their fallback in terms of obtaining a building of this size, they could achieve that. A similar building within the within the curtilage of their of their existing property. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Before we go to the vote, I go back to uh, Councillor Paul Andrews to uh, sum up, please. Thank you. Well, thank you for a great debate, and thank you for the proposal which you're going to vote on in a minute, which I fully support. Um, regarding what the comments of Kevin Bishops just said, a similar size or similar building could be put in into the in the as he's got um, permitted rights, but say similar, not exact. So please keep that in mind. He has got a garage at the front. There's been no mention of removal of that garage for the for the enjoyment of his vehicle. So he. You know, he's removing a garage to to put another garage in. Um, what was discussed about that? I don't know if it was discussed by officers. Um, so, and like I said, in the first instance, there is a large parking area at the front. He has got a double garage. Yes, he has got a business as he runs at Rotherus, um, which obviously takes a lot of his time up. But there you go. That's the end of what I'd like to say. Thank you all for the great debate. Thank you, Councillor Andrews. Um, well, we have a, a motion tabled uh, for deferment of this application uh, plus a site visit. Um, I believe all members have been present uh, for, for the actual presentation and debate. Uh, please make me aware if, if any of you weren't. Um, so therefore we have 13 that are able to vote on this uh, deferment and uh, I go across to um, Mr Brown to uh, take that vote please. Right, um, Councillor Graham Andrews. For. Councillor Polly Andrews. Abstain. Councillor Fagan. Councillor Foxton. Councillor Foxton. Defer. So that's, so that's supporting the proposal to defer. Yeah. Councillor Hardwick. Against. Councillor, Councillor Hunt. Against. Councillor Johnson. For. That's for deferral. It is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Milmore. Against. Councillor Milne. For. Councillor Roan. For. Councillor Selden. For. Councillor Stone. Councillor Stone. For. Councillor Watson. Four. Okay, I make that nine four, three against, and one abstain, Chairman. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so that motion to uh, defer and uh, a site visit uh, has been carried. Uh, thank you. Um,
we now move on to uh, item eight, the third application, um, to which we have no speakers. Um, the application is uh, number three, Avocet Road, Homer, proposed ground floor extension to the rear elevation and create a covered link to the home office garage. Internal alterations to the ground floor of the garage to form room with access to storage area. Um, we have um, Emily Brooks, planning officer, that will make the presentation. Councillor Milmore, who is uh, a member of this committee, is acting as ward councillor for this application, um, has the right to actually open and close the debate, but um, uh, as the ward councillor will not get a vote on this application. Uh, so uh, without further ado, if I could call upon uh, uh, Miss Emily Brooks to uh, make the presentation, please. Thank you, Chairman, Chairman, and good afternoon, members. The case here before members is presented at this committee as the applicant is related to a councillor. This would not usually uh, be dealt with by committee, but as a uh, delegated matter. The scheme is assessed against the adopted Herefordshire Development Plan, which is made up of the core strategy and the Holmer and Chellick Parish Neighbourhood Development Plan. This application is made in full and seeks planning permission for a single storey rear extension and internal alterations to the ground floor of the garage. The site, number three Alvaset Road, is a two-storey detached dwelling located on the newly built Bloor Homes development on Roman Road in the parish of Holmer and Shalick. And as standard, the site is identified here by the Red Star. Next slide, please. In the image to the top of the slide, the application site can be seen edged in red. It should be acknowledged that this map does not show the dwelling, however, the garage can be seen. In the bottom image, um, an aerial image of Roman Road is seen and as you can see here the works for further housing along Roman Road has commenced. Next slide please. This slide shows the existing site plan and measurements of the dwelling and associated garage. The site is bound to the north by the garage and driveway of 5 Avocet Road, to the east by Avocet Road itself, to the south by an access road for properties one, two and three Avocet Road and to the west by the rear garden and garage of number six Avocet Road. Next slide, please. This slide shows the existing elevations and the ground floor and first floor plans and the associated measurements. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed elevations. The single storey extension would have an appropriate approximate height of 2.7 metres and an approximate floor total area of 29 square metres. The extension extends to the rear of the dwelling by 5 metres with a width of 4 metres and occupies the space between the dwelling and the garage. The extension would be constructed of brick to match the existing dwelling, sustainable rubber uh, grey roofing and anthracite UPVC windows and doors. The single storey nature of the extension ensures that it is read as a subservient addition. Moreover, the material choice is to match the existing dwelling and therefore uh, complements the host dwelling. Therefore, this proposal accords to the policies SD1 and LD1 of the core strategy and HS4 of the Helmer and Schellick NDP. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed ground and floor uh, first floor plans. The extension would be accessed via the kitchen and dining area and provides sheltered access to the garage. Here you can see the proposed alterations to the ground floor uh, garage. The proposed works subdivide the ground floor creating a room and storage space. Next slide please. It is important to note that the garden of the property extends beyond the retaining wall and the trees as seen in this image to uh, number five Avocet Road, which is seen on the far right hand side of the photograph. This image helps to show the topography of the site, giving a good understanding of the potential impact on the residential amenity. No concerns have been raised by neighbours with regards to residential amenity, however, it is important to consider. The level differentiation results in the property being at a decreased height to the surrounding properties. The key area for concern was the relationship between the proposal and the rear garden of number six Avocet Road. However, as you can see, the rear garden of number six Avocet Road has fencing erected of which the extension would not exceed. 
and this therefore accords with SD1 of the core strategy and HS4 of the NDP. Next slide, please. Um, moreover, as seen on this image, a large wall has been erected which encloses the garden and this extends uh, to the driveway of number five, Avocet Road. And the proposed extension would not be seen from the road front nor from the driveway of number five, Avocet Road due to the large wall. Therefore, taking into the consideration of the topography of the site and the surrounding properties, it is not considered that harm will be caused to the residential amenity of the adjacent neighbouring properties with regards to overlooking or overshadowing. Next slide, please. In considering the proposed alterations to the garage, it is acknowledged that there is the potential loss for parking. As seen on, that on these images, there is adequate parking available for the property. Moreover, criteria B of policy HS4 of the Homer and Shellac Neighbourhood Development Plan states that garages are excluded when considering off-street parking for new development. Please see a paragraph 6.8 of the officer report. Therefore, it is not considered that the proposal gives rise to any negative impacts on the local highway network, according to policy HS4 of the NDP and MT1 of the core strategy. In addressing the Parish Council's response, see paragraph 5.1 of the officer report. Due to the proposal removing the ability of the garage to be used for car parking, I recommend a condition that ensures the garage shall be used solely for purposes incidental to the enjoyment of the dwelling house and not as a separate unit of accommodation. And this ensures that the development is only used for purposes ancillary to the dwelling. In summary, the proposal has been designed to complement the character of the host dwelling by virtue of scale and materials. It is not considered that the proposal will cause harm to the amenity of the surrounding properties by way of overlooking or overshadowing. And finally, it is not considered that the proposal will negatively impact the local highway network. And therefore, it is my recommendation that planning permission be granted subject to conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Brooks. A very clear presentation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we now move across to um, Councillor Milmore, who uh, will open the debate. Thank you. <coughs> um, the Parish Council and myself have no objections to this application. There's no material reason to object to it. And I urge the committee to approve this application subject to the conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Milmore. Um, I'm looking for somebody to open the debate. Uh, Councillor Polly Andrews. Remove the, I will move the recommendation, Chairman, for approval. Uh, thank you. Have I second it, please? I second it, Chairman. <clears throat> Councillor Johnson, thank you. Um, I have that's table then uh, proposal for uh, approval of this application. Uh, we now move on to uh, Councillor Mill, please. Just, just a small query, if I may. The conversion of the garage uh, um, into two spaces, uh, a room and a store, ni neither of which um, have uh, any illumination. Indeed, the room has no ventilation either. Um, <laughs> I, I, this is not, not something that I think Need, need give us any particular pause. I'm merely curious to know qu quite what the applicant has in mind for these spaces. Do we know? Thank you. Um, if I could uh, ask Ms Brooks to uh, respond, please. Um, with regards to the use of the garage, um, the upstairs is, is used for garage and uh, for an office and downstairs um, simply just states on the application that one side will be used for a room and the other side will be used for a storage. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll answer your question, Councillor Mill. Um, uh, well, I, it, it, I was aware of that because that, that's indeed, I read that on the application myself, that um, okay. just, just uh, a room and a store does, doesn't, um, doesn't tell you very much, but uh, um, I mean, the, the applicant is, is somewhat limited in what, what he, she can do in view of the fact that it has no illumination or ventilation. But there we go. Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Stone. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, just um, following up from other members, I think this is a very sensible application and I, I will be voting in favour of it. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, are we any further comments, please? If not, I move across to um, Mr. Bishop, if uh, you have anything to add, please, before uh, I go back to the local member. Thank you, Chairman. Only to congratulate um, Emily on the excellent presentation um, of the uh, as a as a first item to committee, and so uh, only 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 recently um, engaged by the council as well. So what so very well done. Uh, just to confirm, the internal arrangements to the garage, those could have been undertaken without requiring planning permission, so they could have left those. Um, the, the, there wasn't a need to show those, but they have shown them. Uh, they undoubtedly they they will be illuminated, but they won't be able. Um, uh, but they won't be able to uh, uh, put put windows within them. But uh, that is for the applicants to decide what they want to do, to use for that, whether it's some form of storage, etc. But thank you. Nothing further to add, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bishop. Um, move back across to uh, Councillor Millmore to sum up. Thank you. I have nothing to add to the comments I made earlier. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have um, motion table for approval of this application table by um, uh, proposed by uh, Councillor Polly Andrews and seconded by uh, Councillor Johnson. Um, I believe that all members were present during the presentation and debate. Um, can anybody advise me otherwise? If not, I move across to um, Mr. Brain to uh, take the vote, please. Um, Councillor Graham Andrews? Four. <coughs> Councillor Paul Andrews? Four. Councillor Polly Andrews? Four. Councillor Fagan? Four. Councillor Foxton? Four. Councillor Hardwick? Four. Councillor Hunt? Four. Councillor Johnson? Four. Councillor Milne? Four. Councillor Roan? Councillor Roan, is he gone? Okay. Um, Councillor Selden? Four. Councillor Stone? Four. Councillor Watson? Four. Um, that's carried, Chairman. <laughs> I think that was unanimous, wasn't it, with uh, those who could vote? So yeah. uh, that application is approved. Um, that concludes the business for uh, today. Uh, next um, application, uh, planning committee, I should say, is Wednesday, the 5th of August. Uh, finally, before I formally close the meeting, please can I confirm that the live stream has been switched off